Okay, and we can get started with our discussion on part three of The Way of Integrity by Martha Beck. I have said it every single time. I freaking love this book. I love so do I. I love that we're doing this book club. I love that this was today. I had an experience yesterday that I want to tell the story of and how part three and purgatory like supported me so perfectly. Um, when she, so like we left off in Inferno and that's like descending into the very pit of hell, like the deepest of the depth. And like you crawl down Lucifer's body. And when you get to the very deepest part of the earth, you automatically start climbing back up, even though you didn't change direction. And so purgatory is like the climbing back up part. And the part that really stuck out is when she said that, or I guess this was in Dante's um, divine comedy, but like sometimes the climb up the mountain of purgatory is so steep that you have to fly on pinions of desire. And I never did look up what pinions are. So, you know, like they're small feathers. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, there you go. That makes a lot of sense that they're feathers since we're talking about flying. Um, and I was like, what does that even mean? And I, that was my thought. And then an hour later, I have a task that I really want to do. I want to paint this thing that's on these signs and the signs are up high. They're like hung up by the ceiling. So that means climbing up an eight foot ladder, getting on top of some coolers and painting this on the signs. And I got up there and looked at the top of the cooler and I was like, I don't think I can do this. And I got back down and then I climbed up there the second time. And I was like, no, I want to do this. And because I wanted to do this, I just went ahead and got up there knowing the getting up there part is not the hard part. The coming back down part is really where shit gets crazy. Um, and I just committed. I was like, nope, I'm going to go for it. I'm getting up there. And so it was that desire to paint on the signs that had me go ahead and like jump off the cliff, knowing that I was going to have to face my fear head on, literally coming back down. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I think the climb up purgatory as I, another piece that really stuck out to me that I loved was where she added that like climbing up purgatory, it's like reiterative. Like we do it kind of over and over and over again. Like she said, like first it was, I don't remember her order, but like first it was my religion and then it's intellectualism and then it's I'm gay. And then it's like, it's all the different things over and over. And that got me thinking like, yeah, I climbed purgatory and I faced my fears when I canceled my wedding instead of going through with it. I like, you know, left my software company job with no plans of what I was going to do next. That felt like that of like facing that fear head on. And so much of that, not that it's like you wait until it's not scary anymore, but like she says, like, if you want it bad enough, eventually you'll fly up the steepness that you thought you couldn't climb and your desire will carry you there. Yes. And so like, getting yesterday, getting to see that in action, like right after I had re-listened to it, the way that we were going to do this today, like, this is like such divine timing of if I had that desire of like wanting to paint on, paint on those signs without having just listened to this book, like I probably would have been a lot more likely to just be like, I can't do this. I can't climb up there, but it's like, I've done lots of things that were scary you know, I've had moments where what I wanted ended up outweighing how much I was scared of doing it. And that was, you know, I think that's the process of climbing up out of purgatory. It's like, even though the dark wood of error isn't the life we want, sometimes it can be comfortable and therefore easier to stay in whatever the old way was versus pushing past the fear and breaking the limitation and moving into a new space. So yeah, the, the purgatory chapter, like the others or section, like the other parts has been incredibly supportive. Each of the couple of times I've listened to it, I feel like I get like even more out of it. So, Oh, me too. I've just yeah. finished it for the third time. Yeah. The, and it's, yeah, it's just so affirming. 
and so real. It's <laughs> yeah. What stands out to you guys from the purgatory section? Or like, what did it make you reflect on or really anything that feels good to share? We got the whole rest of the time to just kind of open it up. Well, it's still the reinforcement of that you don't know. Um, I've got someone coming here. I'm just going to quickly say, and then I'll have to mute myself, that, that what, you, what you think may be true may not be true. Yeah. Okay, I'll be right back. Yes. Like the Byron Katie work of, are you sure? Yeah. Like, I think the, the example she gave in the book, Martha Beck, like she wrote a book about the things that she experienced in Mormonism and then developed this belief or this fear that like something terrible is going to happen to me because I wrote that book and she would get just in a panic over who's going to hurt her or put her in prison or like whatever they're threatening to do. And the breakthrough was, are you sure? <laughs> Something terrible is going to happen to me because I wrote that book. Are you sure? Well, no, you know, like anything is possible and that's not fact just because, you know, we might be scared of it kind of thing. And yeah, it's, are you sure? Are you sure? That exactly. We're not sure. And so why not just give ourselves the benefit of the doubt? <laughs> yeah. If it feels better. Right. Like that was kind of the main thing with Byron Katie's work um, was it's not about questioning our beliefs because you're not allowed to believe anything. It's about like really paying attention to what makes you suffer when you believe it. It's not just the thought itself. It's us buying into the truth of the thought. And so if something hurts when you think about it, that's worth questioning and wiggling it loose and trying on the turnarounds and seeing it from other angles. And yeah, are you sure that that's really true? AKA, are you really willing to suffer over that? Is it really worth it? And maybe it is to you in that moment, like no judgment, there's really none, but suffering at that point, like it's like kind of taking your power back on, are you willing to suffer or not? Right. And I really like the concept that we can experience discomfort, even physical pain, and not suffer. Yeah. I love that space of being able to just be with what's happening and not necessarily suffer from it, be free from that suffering. Yeah. So that's an ongoing work for me because I have had so much physical pain and I just don't want to have it. I just refuse to have it depress me or limit mm -hmm. me down. I am too much of a survivor for that. Mm -hmm. So I... I I think that's why I keep rereading this book is I find it so empowering. Yeah. When the book, like when you just want to listen to it over and over and over again, I feel like that's like what she calls the inner teacher, like saying, yes, yes, yes. Reinforcing. Take, Reinforcing. It, take it in. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Myra? What stood out about the purgatory section for you? Uh, telling truth, being honest not lying, even the little, the little lies, the little, uh, when we committing to it and how, uh, it's so difficult. And I admire her for really sticking to it, that, that integrity, even, even on live television, <laughs> it's just, I, I have so much respect for her and wow all the things that she's gone through and yeah. uh but I'm trying to pay attention I haven't committed to doing it like she did but I'm really paying attention to my you know telling the truth yeah and I had, I had an opportunity two days ago and I just I you know I wish I could have done it differently but I wasn't true to what I wanted and something interesting happened to me. I wasn't able to communicate. No, I was with two other people in this, in this exact situation. And it was a practice session for a program I'm in. I could, I could no longer speak. I couldn't come up with words. Wow. 
I could not communicate. And I apologized and said, I, I'm stuck here. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I can't. It was, it was such, it was a shock. I, I was a little nervous. I was a little scared. I was like, what's going on with me? And then afterwards, it was the next day, I realized it was more of a, I don't know, like a neurological thing, maybe. It was like, I wasn't happy. I didn't like what was happening. I didn't want to participate. And I wasn't being honest with them or myself. And so my body just went, nope, you're done. <laughs> you're not going to face it. You know, we're, this is this is what happens. When I realized that, I got a little choked up, a little teary, and I'm like, oh, I wasn't respecting myself and my time. And I got in a situation I didn't want to be in because I didn't want to uh, hurt any or hurt anyone's feelings or or not show up to do some work or I don't know. And I'm, it's not going to happen again. I can tell you that. <laughs> Well, good luck with that. I may, I vow that it won't happen again, and it does. I just feel like you pay such a high price for honesty with so many people. Yeah. Well, I you... have to choose my battles. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if you do stick with what's right for you, less suffering and a potential for something even better, that freedom, that, that flying up to do what, you know, you desire. Yeah. And what would the loss be, really? Yeah. Yeah, it's challenging. If people don't want the truth, like you've got to remember, I live in a cooperative farm. So it's like being married to 14 other adults, but no sex. Just. <laughs> and so this is ongoing relationships with people who don't necessarily want your truth or respect your truth. Wow. And I have a great deal of commitment to speaking against injustice, lying, hypocrisy, but you can only do that so much before people just, if they don't have any commitment to the truth, like my grandma would say, save your breath to cool your porridge. So it's very important for people who we respect in our relationships, but people who don't aren't interested in, in having a real relationship with themselves. That's why, how I figure if they're not interested in being honest and true with themselves, you can't do that with anybody else. So the scariest work is how am I lying to myself? How am I being dishonest with myself? Because I really think I was trained to do that, to behave. Yeah. And in situations where I know that my truth is not welcome, then I work on what's happening inside myself. Yeah. Because right. it's so, so sad that a lot of people don't have any commitment to their own personal truth or to other people's. And if they don't care, save your breath to cool your porridge or express it that's where writing I've done a lot of journaling to express it because my goal of what a cooperative farm is I don't want to think these aren't the right people that's not the right attitude I have to model being honest in a way that other people want to do it and sometimes it scares other people and then and then creates could we just all get along please could we just all be nice and good people which is not real, you know, we're a combination of both. Yeah, true. Martha dealt with that with the church or religion. For sure. Wow. And then uh, mystery faxes, uh, threats, uh, destroying property. Um, she was in fear for her life. Yeah. And she yeah. told her truth. <laughs> Yeah. It's just amazing what, you know, talk about the culture. She and every just so much respect for her. And another thing I, I love about her writing is her humor. Yeah. I, you know, it's like a, a spoonful of sugar with the medicine. I, I love how she does that. And um what she did was extraordinary, but she still kind of is humble about it and there's just something really makes it accessible I guess for everybody but in your situation Janine do you what would happen or obviously you, you're telling me that you have spoken your oh truth. yes very much so 
your, you know, you choose your timing or what's worth fighting for. Yeah. yeah. Because I get labeled a bully. Oh. And I really don't believe I bully. And the people who are on the same list, sort of, sort of the same gist as me or understand where I'm coming from, say that people can feel threatened when you speak your truth around them. Just even being who you really are yeah. can make other people feel threatened and then they are attacking. And so this is one of the reasons why I, I needed this kind of discussion and our group and stuff is because it's so sad to be silenced. But when it's people that you own land with and are striving to be cooperative with, you can't just walk away, you know, you can't just say, okay, I mean, I've, I've lived in cooperation here for 31 years. Some of these people I've lived with for that length of time, you know, if we haven't found a way to communicate by now, it could be a miracle, but I'll keep sending loving kindness and, and hoping to see what blocks there are in myself where I'm falling down and stuck in purgatory in some ways. And how can I leave that again and speak my truth without respect, without disrespecting anybody else? Right. Just like the, the word bully kind of caught my attention as far as something else that was in the, the purgatory section where she talked about I, th I don't remember the guy's name, maybe Carlton, but like the drama triangle. Do you remember that part where it's like there's the victim, the mm -hmm. persecutor, maybe, and the rescuer? And the rescuer, yeah. yeah. Yep, that's and it. And that the only people who like point at persecutors are victims, right? So like them calling you a bully tells you a lot more about the strength of their psyche than anything about you. Well, yeah, like, especially because the situation was that several people had told me they have problems with this guest on the co-op and no one was speaking to her. So she dropped in unexpectedly to see me and asked me some questions. And I said, this may be difficult for you, but I'm having trouble with you in these ways. Like you, you did not meet your financial obligations. And even though it was a small amount to say you're going to do something and not do it when you're getting to know people is a big deal. And she responded with, it's your responsibility to remind me. And I said, no, it's not. When you make a commitment, it's your responsibility to make the commitment. And I'm sorry you're upset by this, but we have to be truthful when we're trying to work together. And other people on the co-op thought it was bullying of me to share with not only my perspective, but what other people had shared with me that they weren't prepared to share with her. So I thought that was unkind. Don't be, don't be ranking up negatives about someone that you haven't discussed with them. But in trying to open up a discussion, I said, this may be difficult, but I want to build, I, I'm open to changing. You know, I, I want to build a relationship here. And so could we discuss this? And the reaction was blaming and attacking. So people get stuck in that triad. That drama triad is so real. I see it all the time to break out of, no, I'm not going to be one of these three things. You know, I'm not going to rescue. I'm going to be centered and grounded and care for myself and reach out from a place of loving kindness and honesty. But not everybody's ready for that. And you can be labeled and attacked. I'm sure you've experienced that as well. Well, more, I mean, maybe I, I could think about it some more for sure. But like, even in telling a story of how they're attacking, you're kind of taking on the victim role in that. Mm -hmm. Do you see it that way? Or am I overstepping? I don't know. I, I, I did feel somewhat, I guess my role has been to speak the truth when others are frightened of it and then get the attack for it, but not take it as personally as other people do, because I'm, I'm very clear that when people attack, it's often from a place of they, they are feeling attacked or something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. I'll be right back again. Sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. Um, I love how she flipped it into like, 
or it was somebody else, another name I don't remember, of like the drama triangle becomes the empowerment dynamic, I think is what it was called, where like victims become creators, rescuers become coaches, and persecutors become challengers. That they're not there to harass you or overpower you or put you down or knock you down or kick you or anything. They're there so that like, just like a player on a football team, like you need a team on the other side or playing tennis, like you need somebody on the other side if you're gonna be able to play the game. And those like people who play the opposition, that they're Mm -hmm. there to help us stand up in our truth in a way that does feel good to ourselves. Cause I get like wanting to be respectful to other people. I do. And I think like we got to start with being respectful to ourselves, like kind of to your point, Myra of like, when you did step away from integrity, your body kind of was like, I'm staying in integrity. So if you want to make me be here, I don't have to participate. Like our body will shut us down if we're <laughs> headed down the wrong path. I have experienced that many and, times, yeah. of like crashing and burnout kind of thing of like, I just couldn't keep doing what I was doing. Um, but yeah, I definitely see, I, I see where I've played the victim. I see where I've definitely been the persecutor and it was coming from fear and defensiveness. And I think my favorite role is rescuer, probably. I do have a, a tendency. Yeah. And yeah. I see how that translates into being a coach, you know, yeah. like instead of coming to the rescue, being like, like she says, like, wow, that's really challenging. What are you going to do about that? Mm-hmm. You know, like you don't need to fix it. Just be there with them, you know, mm-hmm. that that's enough. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I can see those roles and how I've participated in all of them. Family brings out that sense of uh, victim. Yeah. Uh, relationships can do that. Uh, but you do learn. And here's an opportunity, you know, it's always an opportunity to examine it and um, move forward stand up stronger yeah oh it's it's not easy but so worth it and it's scary sometimes step making that step for instance I I can in my situation you know not participate that anymore but I'm definitely concerned that I will make them unhappy or angry or they won't like me that's something that we talked about in the last yeah session oh, but ultimately I'm going to go ahead and do it and <laughs> well and that one reminds me of the story she told from the lady who's like adult drug addict son was living with her and that the husband had like moved out years before because he was just sick of the sun shit and wasn't going to put up with it anymore and she was like broke like trying to support him and like distressed in her emotions like again trying to support him and eventually kicks him out and he goes to prison and she's like in agony over this and in the end he writes her this letter, like, thank you so much for the years that you spent taking care of me. And thank you for kicking me out. Yes. Thank you. Because in the short term, maybe it ruffles their feathers, but like, God, like in the long term, it doesn't do anybody any good to like Janine said, just play nice and get along and like put on your happy face. Like that isn't, a, that's a recipe for being in the dark wood of air. Yes. Like, and lifeless and wandering around with all the other sick, lifeless ones. That's right. That's and then she said she did it, took so much courage. Yeah. Her son. Yeah, exactly. Emotions and, and maybe feeling guilt because he, you know, he was an addict. Yeah. And gave up a, you know, her relationship with her husband. And wow, so much respect. Was she the one that was also in a law firm? 
a partner in a law firm or is that I think I... it was two different people in that same story though where it was a woman of color in the law firm that was addressing the, the racism yes yeah it wasn't the same lady yet another incredibly difficult thing that she had to face and she had the courage to do it oh my goodness more respect it's, these are serious choices to make and and they they did it but I think like you know she had as Martha Beck like tells these stories and tells her own stories that she's always like kind of giving this foundation of the one degree turn mm -hmm. that like we practice in teeny teeny tiny situations like she gives the example of when somebody asks like how are you doing instead of the obligatory oh I'm fine how are you she would playfully say I'm a hot mess how are yes. you doing? And it's like, you don't have to tell your whole life story to be honest, you know, like to not lie in that moment. Like it is such an art of like, when to just stand in your truth and like know it inside of yourself. And like, when is expressing it and to who, when is that helpful and productive? That is so challenging for me, Carly, because I feel like, most people do not want your truth. That's the story you tell a lot. I'm just going to, I've heard you tell that. That's, story well, I live in a very, I, this is the culture I live in. This is what I express. I feel I've, I've endured a lot of isolation and judgment mm -hmm. for insisting. People would regularly say, you belong on the West Coast. You're too much of an environmentalist for Manitoba. Your values aren't right for here. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and we just have to be prepared to face the consequences of being who we really are. But I think most people aren't prepared to do that. And it's, it's high. There's a price for being honest and for have, trying to find some integrity in a culture that values superficial, be a nice person, be kind to everybody. It's a struggle. What is being true to yourself and kind to your own integrity balanced with respecting the delusion that so many people like to perpetuate for themselves. Mm -hmm. that, that makes me think of another part in this. Uh, I can't remember the Japanese name, but when people were struggling and suddenly had an awakening, um, like the mother of six. Satori. And, that's it, thank you, thank you. Um, and her husband uh, had an accident on the work site. So there was, how am I gonna support my family? And she just, it was too much. She, did, she couldn't find a solution. She wanted to kill herself. And in that moment, something happened that she realized she did wanna live and she found a way and um, she, it wasn't easy. She did get help. She went to nursing school. Um, I think there was another example of someone having having an awakening as well. Um, and then that you can uh, you can see neurologically in the brain, there's like a shift too. And that amazes me. That makes me think there's just so much more going on. There's a whole nother level that we're, you know, we're just in this silly little uh life that we think is oh so important but there's there's a whole lot more going on there really is mm. yeah it is really like when you're in the moment it's it's a challenge and it feels you you know it's it hits you hard but when you step away too it's what a gift that would be to have that awake awakening all at once wow instead of the little incremental bits that we get but those are nice too don't get me wrong those are really nice too <laughs> but I would kind of like bam let's be there let's fly I want to fly well and I think like the like the pinions of desire or whatever like in that analogy like what causes us to fly is our desire for wholeness Mm -hmm. Like what caused that woman to kick out her drug addict son was she wanted to be whole and balanced and 
Yeah. Like as much as she loved him and couldn't stand to do that to him, she ended up choosing her own wholeness. Yes. That that was more important. And wow. it takes a while to get there, you know, like, yeah, everybody is so yeah. different. It, the desire for our own wholeness. And I love like that. Yeah. The story of the woman who was going to kill herself and she's like, well, I'll just sit here and like, take one last look. Yeah. And then she was like filled with this joy for being alive. And she's like, wait, I don't want to die. I just don't want to live how I was living. Like what? Oh. And so she went home and she like changed her life. Like I, you know, like, I'm just not gonna, I'm not going to be in that religion. I'm not going to be in that culture. I'm not going to be under the obligation to be anything to anybody. I'm going to do what feels right to me. I'm going to feed these babies and I'm going to keep them alive. Like culture be damned. And at that point, the opposition isn't limiting. It kind of seems ridiculous that anybody would ever tell another person how they should try to live their life. Like people should just get to do what, what they want to do. That's Hallelujah. Awesome. <laughs> if only we would give each other that freedom to just be who we are and not pressure each other all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But That's then you really have the experience of making these choices and seeing where you can go. Like you were saying with the opposition, we need that to grow. Mm -hmm. Good examine what's going on. And yeah. Yeah. Have that experience. I I have a podcast episode, Janine. I don't know if you've listened to it called The Price of Authenticity. And it is essentially talking about the opposition that is bound to come when you show your real self to the world, you take your creative heart and you put it on display. You are granting other people the freedom to have their own opinion about whatever it is. And that episode goes through the story of somebody who had a very nasty reaction to my creation and began a process of harassment that went on until earlier this year. Um, and that like, even in that situation with that person, like I'm, I'm nothing but grateful for him and his life and everything that he has gone through that has led him to be who he is because in his extreme dislike of me and my creation, it really let me get a stronger grip on why am I making the creation in the first place? Why am I putting it out into the world in the first place? And the answers to both of those was because that's what's authentic to me. That's what's true to me is that I do want to create it because it feels good. And I do want to share it again, because it feels good. And I want to trust that no matter what anybody else has to say about it. And that, that doesn't mean that like when the harassment started, it wasn't like really upsetting. It was, but working through that as far as like, coming up against that challenge it was very growth inducing in terms of me being stronger in my core and not being so open or dependent to the opinions or feedback of other people on what I'm doing like they don't know they don't no. have access to know anything anything about my life I don't care how good they think they know me like <laughs> nobody but me is in here and everybody else's opinion is, a, is much more a reflection of them than it is of what's in here with me. So yeah, the desire for wholeness, the desire to be who we were born to be, like either it outweighs the challenge of the opposition or it doesn't yet. And I think the more we feel the challenge of the opposition, the more our desire grows until like those pieces where people have the sudden awakenings. I think it's like, such extreme pressure that the okay. desire is like equal you know like it like snaps or something because the desire gets so strong Maybe. i think about i've thought about you a lot carly as i was reading this well you introduced me to the book of course but you're uh 
your videos, things that you put out there, like you were saying, it's, I don't want to stumble over this word, unapologetic. Um, you're just, uh, I think that's why uh, I was so drawn to, you know, the content, how you just, you're just, you put it out there. And it, um, it makes, like, me feel more comfortable with the things that I'm going through and you know what you 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 say what you aspire to you share your successes and things that you're you struggle with and you just you'll put it out there that authentic authenticity and I love that so it's so refreshing and inspiring I completely yeah. agree with you yeah well thank you yeah. I believe I believe that like, you know, Janine, back to your story of like, people aren't ready for my truth. I believe that the people who aren't ready for my truth aren't the people that I'm meant to spend time with. And the people who do receive my truth well are the ones that I'm meant to spend time with. So it's really a blessing to get to see how people react because if they're turned off by who I am, which I meet plenty of those people in my life. I don't know if you would know that based on how yeah. I choose to express myself. I meet plenty of people who can't stand me, you know, like I rub them the wrong way instantaneously and you mm -hmm. can just see the disgust on their faces and I can see, Oh, somebody's got demons in there and they don't <laughs> want to look at them and they can't stand me to be close to them because I bring it to the surface. Yes. So they don't want to be around me and that's okay because they're not ready, you know, like to take that example of Byron Katie's the work and like do the turnarounds on, you know, people aren't ready for my truth. Like as an example, the turnarounds that she suggests are like, turn it around in the, in the first place, turn it around to yourself and turn it around to them. So like the first turnaround is people are ready for my truth that that could be just as true as people aren't ready for my truth. The mm -hmm. second one is I'm not ready for my truth. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. Depends on the situation, depends on the day. And the mm -hmm. last one is they're not ready for their truth. And you just got to give them a break. <laughs> like, yeah. God damn it. If they, if they can't face it, they can't face it. And that's not our business. Our business is to keep doing us and to find the people who are receptive. Yes. Who thank find you. It refreshing, you know, like to, to have people call me that, like, that's just wild to me because there are plenty of people in this world who would call me very different things, you know, like, oh my gosh, I had an employee one time who she sat and she sobbed in front of me and was like, I don't know how you can treat people like this. I don't know how you can sleep at night. I don't blah, 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 blah. Like this was her opinion of me for like 90 minutes of like trying to tell me what an awful human being I am to treat her this way. This was her story. Mm -hmm. And I sat there and I listened and I, I mean, I let her say what she needed to say. And in the end she quit. I didn't, I mean, I just listened. I didn't have anything to say. I don't see it that way. Like, okay. And I mean, people get to have whatever opinion they want. They just do. They get Yes, they do. And your reaction can make all the difference. I think I shared at an earlier group, one of the women that I've worked really hard to be loving and supportive for and, and have done, given her a ton of support with her children, spent a lot of time in uh, supporting her in a relationship and her getting back into school at a recent meeting last year was yelling at me for not assuming responsibility. And I knew inside myself, which of us was not assuming responsibility. And so I just gently placed my hand on her arm and looked into her eyes and she switched from yelling to sobbing almost immediately. And then started saying, I know you've always done from come from your heart, Janine. And like, she just stopped it. And I didn't have to defend a response at all. I just truly felt compassion for where she was. And it switched her to a totally different place. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a challenge though, to be that in touch. And I'm, I'm so sorry, there's a bit of an emergency on the co-op and, and you can tell I've had to come in and out. I'm going to have to go out again, but I'm really hoping to come back in fairly okay. shortly. So I, I'm sorry, gals, this is no part of the life with on a cooperative in Manitoba in winter in a 
<laughs> anyway, I'll be right back. Okay. I hope. No worries. <sighs> he, in this uh, um, part of the book too, she talked about communicating and, and catching someone's eyes and looking in their eyes when you're expressing what's going on with you and what a difference that can make. And, you know, the people aren't going to look you in the eyes, you know, but to have someone listen, yeah. kind of like what you're saying, the people that can relate to what you're, what you have to offer. I, I think it's similar, you know, I, I see you, I, I know what you're doing. Yeah. So yeah. And then people weed themselves out. You don't have to waste your time. Exactly. <laughs> like if you don't like, I think part of that is what she's talking about in general, as far as busting loose from culture, culture, where I grew up in the Midwest you know, like there's a lot of value placed on politeness and manners and respecting your elders and all kinds of good shit that they like to enforce those rules. Mm -hmm. Like my mom lectured me within this last year about cursing in front of my grandma. I'm in my thirties and she's <laughs> like giving me a lecture about how that's disrespectful to your elders and blah, 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 blah. Like trying to enforce culture's rules on me. <sighs> <laughs> I didn't go back for a few months after that. I'm like, it's my grandma and it's my mom. And I'm sorry, but if you do not want to hear my authentic self-expression, then I'd say you don't want to spend time with me. Yeah. You can take your box and you can put it in the dumpster. I'm not getting in there, period. It's not disrespectful. It's authentic. If she has a problem with it, I'm sorry, but that's not... That's not my work. Yeah. It doesn't matter if she's my grandma. It doesn't matter if she comes from a generation where that's just inappropriate. Like, I'm sorry, that's not my business. It's not. And that's where, you know, all day, every day, we get to choose what's more important. Mm -hmm. Being true to inside yourself or playing by the rules of the culture. And I, yeah, I don't know how to play by the rules of the culture and not want to leave this earth, you know, right. like every time I've ever tried to stay in the box, it sucks the life out of me to where I don't want to be here. And so I had to get out of the box if I wanted to stay alive. And now when people try to put me back in there, I'm like, you just weeded yourself out, yeah. you bought yourself a one-way ticket out of my life. And that's not my business either. You know, like it sounds detached and maybe a little cold, but I don't think so. I think it's a fierce loyalty to my own truth. Yes. It's how it feels on the inside. It doesn't feel disrespectful to them. It feels like it honors me and somebody who doesn't want to see it that way. Again, that's not my business. Yeah. Because another way of looking at it is they don't respect you. They or... don't want me. They yeah. want the to... little... Barbie doll version of like, just sit there and be there and do what we told you to do and be good and behave. Like Janine was saying, like, I mean, we all get trained to behave by our parents. Like good behavior is like one of those things in childhood that you want all the gold stars. You want all the candy. You want all the all love the attention. Of exactly. Yeah. From, you all know, avoiding right. punishment, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We're trained for that. Yeah. And it can lead to some, you know, really tough, tough choices as time goes on. You can get yourself into some situations and so much time has been wasted. I shouldn't say that because that's something we talked about in the last one. Has it? Because Maybe this is the perfect time. Right. Are you sure that Are time you... got wasted? Yeah. Yeah. Because so much is so much learning, so much really getting to identify and then making that choice. Maybe this is how it's supposed to play out. And it's always now. It's always right now. So maybe that's the knowledge now. 
you have mm-hmm. the, the wherewithal and the awareness now, even like the experience that you talked about, um, where like you, you couldn't speak or whatever in the mm-hmm. group. And that reminded me so much of in the group coaching program, a few, a few weeks, uh, a couple months ago, I got my period the morning of the session and was like, I should just cancel. And then I didn't, I was like, no, because we have a schedule and I I have responsibilities and I'm just going to like charge through. And I went home after that and was like, why did I do that? I'm never going to do that again. And then the next month, same exact thing happened. And I canceled the session because like, because now I know, I know better. Like when I have a feeling of, I don't have the energy for this and I should cancel I'm not going to make myself do it for reasons of keeping the other ones off my back or whatever. Like yeah. the right other ones will understand. And you guys were all like, oh my gosh, yes, take care of yourself. That's no problem. No big deal. All good. Nobody had anything negative to say whatsoever. And if anything, I get more of the reaction, like, thank you for doing that. I love seeing examples of how to how to say like, I don't have the energy for this or how to cancel plans in a way that's respectful and honors myself or whatever, like the right people get it and they appreciate it even when you do cancel the plan. So yeah, yeah, the ones who don't get it. Never, yeah, I I shouldn't say never, but uh, yeah. And the price that you pay is, I think sometimes culture-wise, we go in thinking, you know, I can take it. I'll take it for the team. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll power through this and, you know, maybe there's, you'll feel better. I'll feel better about it if I can power through it. And nope. Somehow, some way you're going to pay the price yeah. and you're exhausted afterwards. And yeah. So, well, that part like reminds me of the Mount Delectable in the was that in the dark wood of air that people are climbing mount delectable i think it is but i don't know for sure i think you're right i think that was the one but mount delectable where you think like i'll just keep the peace i'll i don't want to rock the boat like i'll just push through i'll just meet the deadline i'll just you know pull an all-nighter so i can get it done like and you do that over and over again and that's like the mount delectable you get to the top of it and there is no there there there's like it's not anything except physical exhaustion and you still don't have anything to show for it right yep Empty. yep which makes me think about the culture and when you're behaving in certain ways like for your parents mm-hmm. or family members and you think well I'm going to get something you know that love or whatever approval and no it's just continual you you realize you're in your 30s and they're <laughs> still, still giving you lectures on what's <laughs> appropriate behavior. I'm like that ship has sailed. Right? Because I'm not gonna uh, if I behave this way, it's only gonna I'm gonna feel bad about you know giving giving up on myself and yeah, no, it wouldn't have felt good. Right, like silencing myself, basically. Like Janine said, it feels awful to be silenced and <laughs> I'm a big believer that the only one that can silence me is me. And so like my mom in that situation, trying to silence me doesn't actually silence me. Me agreeing to do what she says, that may silence me, but I would rather not go there and just choose to be in spaces where my truth is not seen as offensive. And, you know, that's a personal choice. That's like, again, your values and your beliefs, like we're in Sagittarius season while we're recording this and the things that we believe, they guide how we choose to act and show up in the world. And yeah, I'm, I don't believe that I should get in a box because somebody else asked me to. So if that's what's required to enter that space, then I guess I just won't go. And that'll be your loss, not mine. Yeah. Cause yeah, I'm happy you're here to <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy you're here, Myra. Because like that's just it. When you really do like put yourself out there, like in the couple years that I've been doing that, 
I've gotten this one hater. I've gotten a couple hate comments, but like nothing persistent, like one thing here or there, but like this one person who they stuck it out and they really wanted me to know how terrible I was and like tried to communicate with that with me over a good chunk of time. But like, that's been the only one. Everybody else is so appreciative and so like, your story like was so relatable and helped me see this about myself or, you know, whatever. And yeah, there's plenty of people out there who want to hear from you and want to hear your truth and want to support you and whatever your authentic choices are. And like that at the very end of um, one of the last chapters in the purgatory section, she's like, find the trusted other that you can like express your truth to And basically, like, as you start to express your truth, if that trusted other responds with anything negative or putting you down or anything, like shut down the conversation and find a different trusted other, because that one's not it. And like, sometimes we have friends or even people close up to us who like, as much as they're close to us, they're really not a trusted other in the sense that like, they're gonna unconditionally accept our authentic self and like support and love us no matter what our truth is. I, yeah, I mean, not everybody is capable of that. And that's, that's the special thing I think about how you find like the people you're meant to spend time with on this planet. We're not meant to spend time with 8 billion other people. We don't have time for that. You got to be pretty selective if you want to fit it in. I don't know why you'd spend time with people who like don't want to hear your real self. You know, yes. like they could hang out with anybody and make them fit in the box. Like, no. Yeah. Uh, again, going back to Martha, her marriage. What what a wonderful marriage that was. That they got to, they loved each other. She and her husband truly did so much. Yeah, they could tell their truth stick together make it work that's extraordinary yeah to have someone in your life like that yeah that's a gift I love that story and it was good for their children yeah and you know how much they loved and respected each other just amazing it seemed like like actually unconditional love Yeah, Like their love wasn't conditional on you're my wife or you're my husband. Like, yeah, like I want you as a soul to be happy in your life. I want you to be who you are, whatever that looks like. Even if that means like, you're going to, you know, we're going to go our separate ways. Like, I want you to have what you want. And that to me feels like unconditional love. And it feels like what's possible when you cut like kind of staying in your own truth and staying in your own integrity, I think is another way of saying like being unconditionally loving to yourself. Mm -hmm. Like I kind of want to talk about a little bit and maybe your example is a good one for this conversation, but like, like in the situation before you couldn't speak, right? Like when it was happening and you don't like it and this is not whatever, like we don't have to get into details, doesn't matter. But like at some point there was the choice of, do I act out my disagreement with this situation and take myself out of it probably, or do I stay and like maintain the status quo? And like, there was a choice of staying and maintaining the status quo. And I think that's really like, even though that's like one little moment why do we maintain the status quo? Like, where does that come from as far as, do you know what I mean? Like, why didn't you say what you needed to say about what like wasn't lining up? I didn't want to, you really want me to kind of- Yeah, I mean, if you you have an answer. Yeah, I'm happy to, sure. I um, didn't want to come across as flaky. I didn't want to 
upset anyone. I wanted their, I wanted them comfortable and I wanted them to like me and be, um, I'm trying to think, there's probably so much more. I just wanted it to go well. I was not happy. I was really tired. I was kind of annoyed. Um, it wasn't going the way I wanted it to. There wasn't focus. It was supposed to be practice. I felt disrespected at one point. Um, I, the person that wanted the to set up this practice session was late. Um, the time and the day was the least convenient for me, but I made it work. Um, so there, I, I was feeling kind of resentful too, but I didn't feel like it was worth calling that out. And there were a few more things in it and uh, that were said. And I think in my mood, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, was that comment that person just said, was that an insult? And then I was remember thinking, well, you're obviously tired, and not in the right frame of mind. I, you don't know if it's true. And, and so there was a, all sorts of things going on. And then I had to go ahead and speak. And I know what I'm doing and how to go about it. But all of a sudden, my brain shut down and I stopped and no words would come. And I, I, there was like this kind of long pause. And then I apologized and I said, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know what to say. And the person kind of was, oh, that's okay. Just go ahead. <laughs> like, I, I can't. I don't know what to say. It was a, the strangest experience not having words. I had that happen one time before I had a migraine. I don't know if you ever get a migraine, but sometimes one of the symptoms is you can't speak. You can't get your words. You can't. It's just too much. And it was sort of like that. And I felt embarrassed and I felt like I failed and I started to beat up on myself. Like, what is wrong with you? You know, you got to get a grip. And um, I was concerned and I was afraid that I wouldn't be good enough in my pride. It, it just spun out of control. The more I'm talking, I'm realizing this was a real <laughs> internal drama. It was the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, <laughs> quite a bit, but and it was, they're oblivious. <clears throat> And it all happened in here. Um, but I did realize the next day that you didn't honor yourself. And they don't know. And they probably really don't even care. These are basically strangers to me. And it's if I'm not comfortable, that's good enough. That That's good enough. Um, I don't have to participate in that. And it doesn't mean that I'm a failure. <laughs> I made it. I made it this long in life. I think you know. I have some successes. You're doing okay. I'm gonna be all right, <laughs> one way or another. Oh. I've done difficult things. I don't know if I answered your question, but I, no, I think like unpacking it like that was yeah. very just interesting, if nothing else. And yeah, I think there's so many reasons that, like, it really does sound like all the rules of culture. Yes. That like kept you in your box of like, no, you got to behave like this. Otherwise they're going to throw flaky at you. They're going to like, you know, all the, all the worst things you could be maybe. Are you sure? Right. right, right. Like, are you sure that that's a bad thing to get called flaky? Um, yeah. I mean, it would prove, prove other people that have said that right. When I'm trying other people in my life that have made criticize me and said I wasn't good enough or wouldn't listen to me or, you know, it's mm -hmm. like it opens up that wound. Mm. But I think I'm trying to, you know, fulfill whatever so that I don't have to hear that because, yeah. Ooh, what a, this is really good. That got in there deep real quick. <laughs> right down in there. That was awesome. Um, because <laughs> that's like it's such a perfect example of, you know, like you're not good enough. You're blah 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 like to turn it around like are you sure yes and then the turnarounds like you are good enough that's one 
Oh my god. He agrees. He agrees. Concurs. Concur. That's second. Second. <laughs> you are good enough. Come the here. dog has spoken. Buddy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's a thing. See, we don't even have to do the other ones. We already found the right one. <laughs> That's my guy. Yeah. That's a good He's guy. <laughs> So but for real, those those people's, you know, opinions that get stuck in our heads and then we get worried that they might be true. Like right. that's what it was. Those are the ones to like, are you sure that that's real? Kind of like you said, like I made it this far. <laughs> um seems to be going okay. Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That it was a whole lot of drama in my head over a very simple. But you know, not simple, like it just happened to be, I, I think it's more like it ends up being like the perfect storm of like all the right pieces. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like, it's not even just a zoom. It's not just people. It's not just time. It's like all of these different pieces of people you don't know that well, and we're supposed to be here for a purpose. And it's this other program that you're getting a lot out of and enjoying and wanting to practice your skills. So like, there were like all of these different factors that collided and created the perfect scenario for you to have like a lot of buttons pushed. It's yeah. like, you know, like a lot of dust kind of got kicked up that like, why is this so huge? It seems so simple. And yet it doesn't feel that simple. It feels like a lot. And how cool that they were late and disrespected you and goofed off when you were supposed to be working. Like yes. it lets you see like so many different things about, you know, like who you're like the, like the kind of the self-imposed box right? Like culture trains us and they take the box and they try to put it on us. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like our parents go on and we move on by ourselves. And then we are the ones like putting ourselves in the box or like putting the limitations on us. Like I have to be punctual. I have to like work hard. I have to be focused. I have to say the right thing or whatever. Like we do that to ourselves because of the conditioning that we went through like it's very understandable but it sounds like that brought you face to face with a lot of culture and again like how cool right before we're going to come together and like have this book club and talk about it that's right yeah and as as you were laying that out I realized a couple other things and that's exactly what it was it it was just me having an idea about it and yeah wow how liberating it is you know I am so much better today than I was the other day and I have a, a fresh attitude so maybe that's one of my little uh baby steps so the next time I find myself in a situation I can handle it and yeah. handle it better yeah I'd rather have these smaller ones than something, you know, where there's a whole lot on the line. Well, yeah. You think about like the, the pressure that causes the instant full awakening or whatever, like that lady with six kids and she's 25 and her husband is like debilitated now. Right. Like, I don't think you really want one of the big awakenings. Like that sounds horrible. Um, <laughs> to live under that much pressure I I'm I'm definitely way more on the side of like I would rather have like a beach ball size of pressure and right. get the growth out of that and give me a few days to like find my balance and then give me another one and yeah let's do it again well but, said. yeah I oh that massive pressure and I think it's also very normal to like when your buttons get pushed when your own beliefs like are reflected back to you in an uncomfortable way where it like stirs up your dust um yeah I think like next time like how I guess oh, how do I want to ask that like how would you recognize that you're in the middle of it how would you how would you like coach yourself in that situation you know like 
how do you think it would go down? Like kind of same situation, but now you have that under your belt. I uh, was thinking about that after I had my little realization. Uh -huh. I wouldn't have agreed to the time. Oh, I, I was going to be really tired. That and, was the beginning of it was yeah. that time is not ideal, but you made it work. I made it work. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You shouldn't have been there in the first place. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. I'm an early riser. Uh -huh. I like, you know, and then I had other commitments during the day and this was after the sun went down and I, I had nothing left. I had no gas in the tank, yeah. but it worked for them. And so I would have honored myself and said, you know, I'm so sorry, but that's just not going to work for me. Yeah. That would have helped. Such a me. practical solution. Is yeah. it yeah, right. Like it it seems so like um complicated. Like, what am I supposed to say to the other person? Or like how do I get them to agree with my blah blah blah? It's like it does it's not even like that. It really is like all you had to do was say, No, I can't meet then. And probably most of the rest of the situation wouldn't have played out the way that it did. You know? I didn't think it was important enough. Oh, I'll be tired, but I can power through it. You know, because what else, you know, it's not, there's nothing going on here that, but knowing that, you know, when you're tired, you're tired and you have nothing to give. Yeah. It's, you have to rest too. So, yeah. Mm. I, I feel bad saying that. I actually just now feel bad saying that it's okay to say I'm tired and I can't do it. Like it makes you feel bad? <laughs> I'm like, that's not good enough. What do you mean? <laughs> oh, shit. Right. That's I don't funny. think I've lesson yet, but I'm rec I recognize. Well, okay. I mean, that's that's the whole point of purgatory being reiterative. It's right. like you climb it over and over and over, and you you cleanse of the old conditioning and the old cultural rules, like a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. So, I mean, you've done it enough to admit that rest is important, even though you're like gritting your teeth on the inside like the culture is still it's still in there you know like there's still some more of your power to come out of that particular yeah. egg but <laughs> if this definitely helped I mean yeah. to set you up to well and like I said like when I had the thought on that first session I should cancel because I don't have the energy for this it was basically the same thing of yeah. like no there's an agenda it's a, it, you're scheduled to be there. So you have this responsibility, you need to show up. And so I did, and it was okay during the session. Yes, it was. But when yeah. I went home, I like crashed and was so like, I just, I, I did like a whole thing about it after the fact, because like that space, I haven't been there in years. And what it was, was like, kind of like you said, like when you are so drained of energy I couldn't speak. I couldn't think I couldn't like, it took me days to recover from putting myself in that spot. And again, same as yours. Like, I didn't think it was important enough. It's just your period. Like everybody works on their period all day around the world, everywhere, like all the time, like just toughen up and you'll be fine and blah, blah, blah. And I went and I did it. And I swore to myself when I got home, like, I'm never doing that again. If it's day one, then whatever it is gets canceled, period, period, literally. Right? Yeah. yeah. Not doing that to myself. It's not worth it. But I had to go through that to, I had to like suffer through the aftermath of that session for a few days to like really let it sink in. Like you put yourself in that situation. Nobody else, nobody from my culture was there telling me anything. I told myself, I put that box on myself I put those rules on myself yeah and you don't have to I don't have to do that and so yeah I changed the rules for myself in the discomfort of the first one and then when the second one came around I was like hey guys guess what yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. not happening you honored it I you, did yeah it was so easy it was like just wake up and there it is and it's like all right well I guess we're not doing that yeah there was no culture there was only last time and how clear it was that I'm not going through that again. It's not worth that. So yeah, we have yeah. to go through the, mm -hmm. the part where we abide by culture and it has to suck. So we will let it go. 
Yeah. And the residual stuff, like I'm really examining this. Mm -hmm. And it's, just, it's good to make these choices because you are recognizing that you are worth the effort. It's important to rest and, and you're worth it. And it hard yeah. to me, it's hard for me to go, I'm worth it. I'm worth that's a tough yeah. one too in our culture. Totally. Yeah. Like where does your value come from? Is it from showing up and being good and yeah. adding value and helping people? Just like your God. Yeah. I tend to fall into that trap. I mean, that's definitely our culture is that, you know, like hard work was basically the church I was raised in. And like, if you're not doing 12 hours a day, you're slacking. Mm -hmm. And dude, that almost killed me. Literally. Yeah. It's like, you can't, no, that's not, that's not my truth. That can be your truth. If you really want to hang on to it, you can, but yeah, if you want to be healthy and take care of yourself, that's selfish. Right. And that's are you sure? <laughs> selfish. No. Is, is sure. The opposite of selfish. Is it empowered? Like, yes. you know, it, Oh, I like that. Ooh, you just got to wiggle out from under any of the things that culture gave you that feel rotten in your system you I got, love that power yeah. word there that yeah. that's good well because like wouldn't it have been empowered to reply to that email and say hey guys I you know I'm not an evening person maybe we could compromise and do a middle of the day I'm also free on weekends I am pretty flexible but my energy's not going to be there in the evening. So I'm just, you know, I can't, can't, yeah. do it. can't do it. Yep. Just lay it out there for lay sure. It out there. Yeah. And oh. the unapologetic thing, you know, like I actually, this is kind of a fun story that I don't think I've ever told before, but when I worked at the software company, they, they were quite the characters on many fronts, but one of the things that they taught us when we moved to like the team that supports the clients, like the big deal clients, they teach you that if an apology is going to be given, either the president or the executive vice president will give the apology. If you are not one of those two people, do not ever apologize to one of our clients ever. And like, that was such a hard rule that like it really challenged the cultural like you know when somebody asks you for something and the answer is no the first thing is oh I'm sorry but blah 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 and like we're not allowed to say sorry that was like stricken from our vocabulary because it implies liability is the point that if we made a mistake that truly the company needs to apologize for the people at the top of the company will apologize on behalf of the company but we do not have the authority to issue an apology to anyone. We do not have the authority to admit wrongdoing to any of our clients, which is like a cover your ass type training policy, if I've ever seen one. But I really, really appreciated that experience because it has me, you know, anytime I want to apologize to someone, I really dig into why. Like, am I at fault here? Did I do something wrong that I need to make an apology for? Do I owe them an apology because I'm not an evening person and I'm not going to meet with them in the evening? I don't think so. You know, like, but in culture, especially as women, like when you can't just do what's asked of you, you better be ready with an apology and an excuse and a justification and all the reasons to prove why you can't do what was asked of you. And so true as women we're I'm sorry is we say it it's all so natural time. yeah apologizing all the time for what it's such a habit it's yeah. so it's that, culture yeah it's so amazing. it's good to really that you had that experience that now you think about it first that yeah. there's a second where you're like that's good that's and helpful. I think it, it really like shifts to that. That's not to say that I don't ever apologize. Right. Like I say, sorry, when I did something wrong, yes. when I, when I speak to someone in a way that after the fact, I'm like, I did not mean to do that. And I make sure that I tell them, 
or like, you know, I totally forgot yesterday I had a meeting at two and it was this morning when I saw the person's note, like, Hey, are we still meeting at two? And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like I was, I felt like almost sick that I had like completely blown off this person in our meeting to your point about the person was late. I didn't even show up. Oh my God, I felt so bad. I apologized. That was like first order of business. Like I said, I would be there. I didn't come. I am sorry for wasting your time. I am sorry for disrespecting your time. Like that was part of it. So yeah, like I do think that apologizing has its place and like saying when you're wrong or when, you know, if I could do that differently, I would have changed this. So next time I'm going to really try to be more mindful of X, Y, Z. Like I try not to just say, I'm sorry. I try to say like, here's what I learned and here's how I think it'll be different next time kind of thing. If I truly did something wrong, but if it's just, you asked me something and I have to say no to you, that doesn't obligate me to an apology. You know, I don't owe you what the thing you asked me for, but. True. And then when you think about your apology, it's authentic, sincere, genuine, and that. Right. Instead of a reflex, I'm sorry, because, you know, yeah, that's not genuine. That's just a habit. Yeah. Especially for women. I think you, if you look like men don't do that. No, they don't. And don't start sentences with, I'm sorry, but like, (laughs) why are you apologizing for existing as you are? Like, I mean, I get it. I totally get it. It's a cultural habit and there's so many people out there doing it. But this is one of those things where it's like saying I'm fine when I'm not. When you say, I'm sorry, but I can't meet in the evenings. Like, are you really sorry? Probably not so much as you know, I'm sorry, I can't do what you asked me to do. Maybe you are a little bit sorry about that, but like yes. it, yeah, it's like dishonest to just automatically be sorry. Like maybe you're sorry. Maybe you're just wanting to smooth over the conflict of having to say no. You know? Exactly. That's what it is. And I think it chips away at, yeah. you know, your worth. You're willing to take all these hits. Yeah. Little hits all the time just to make sure everyone's comfortable. And that can take a toll. Yeah. But just being straightforward and honest and just saying, you know, I wish I could, but I can't. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a good lesson. Even though yeah. in our culture, we are socialized to be a certain way. You yeah. can recognize it. And not do it anymore. It's a fun exercise. System, it's not, don't do it. Huh? <laughs> well, it's a fun exercise. Like when you like, let's say in the next time you're typing an email like that. And like I, I did this the other day where um, I missed a deadline on something where I had three months to do it. And then I did I was supposed to do it right at the last minute. And then I was a little bit sick. And so I canceled and we had to delay it. And that mean that meant I missed the deadline. And when I went to email the people whose deadline it was, the first thing that I wrote was, I'm sorry, but, and mm-hmm. then I deleted that. And then I wrote, unfortunately, blah, blah, blah. And then I deleted that. And I was like, how do I say this in a way that is true, is factual, honors what was, like, gives me credit as far as like, I didn't intentionally do this. I'm not maliciously disrespecting your deadline it just is what it is and now I need to communicate that to you and so like trying to make the message as neutral as it could be not necessarily for their benefit but for mine for that Mm -hmm. reason like what you're saying of like I'm not going to take fault here my body got sick and before that the other person was like pushing me off for three months so like it's it's not my fault like it was outside of my control and I don't have to be on the hook. I didn't do anything wrong here. So I don't have to like belittle myself to, I don't even know. Like, I know. yeah, like, I don't know. It's just interesting to like be mindful of those kinds of language when yes. you go to express your truth. 
like I agree yeah how did you word it or did you send the email at all I did let me let me look real quick because it's I'm just curious how you you know it's pretty you were about it. yeah and you didn't you, you I didn't it. apologize and I didn't call it unfortunate that's awesome yeah let me see here Yeah, I'm trying to imagine how I would communicate that after this conversation. If you just talk about the deadline. Okay, yep, here we go. Okay. Hi, so and so and so and so. I wanted to let you know I had to delay my on site visit to blank. It was supposed to be Saturday, November 26th, but due to illness has been moved to Friday, December 16th. Oh, I did apologize. I do apologize for any headache this causes on your end. And I appreciate you letting us know if this updated timeline is acceptable. So I did apologize because I don't know if that deadline like is for grant money that needs to be spent, that they're going to have to submit an application to like extend their own deadline. Like but I also led with, I you already made it. this change. <laughs> I already did this. And, this happens, and, and if this causes you any difficulty, I, which, oh, you, you apologize. Yeah, I don't uh, want that, but it yeah. is what it is. And so start right. with just owning the truth and, yeah. and then, yeah, be respectful to any impacts or complications that might come out of that. Like, but we'll figure it out. And then what she said I was like so nervous. I probably spent an hour writing that email and you heard it's like two sentences. And then she says, um, no worries, Carly, we're flexible. Thanks for letting us know. That was, that was the whole response. And I was like, really, really in, in that email, like trying to make it be fair to me and good for them and like, fair to the other person who was involved. Like, yeah, I just wanted to like, how, well, how would I say this if all I was doing was stating the facts? And that's kind of what I ended up with there at the beginning. Yeah. Well, going forward, it would be easy. It'll be easier now. Yeah. So yeah. That it's whole process. process. Yeah. 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 And to I got something out of it too. So good. Good, good. <laughs> well, and I gotta think, like, to your point of I knew I could feel that morning when I woke up and knew like, you know, today's the 26th and I'm supposed to go there. And it's like a four hour drive round trip. Plus it's five hours of work once I'm there. And so like, it's a nine hour ordeal and that was going to fill up that whole day. And there was no day off in sight. There's like at least a week and a half, if not a couple weeks of like, there's no more break in the wall. And mm -hmm. so I already feel like I have a really sore throat and I'm like teetering on the edge of, do I go and stick with my obligation to go? I, we had this scheduled, we're on the deadline, you know, do I go or do I postpone it and cross my fingers that they'll have mercy on me and it'll all be okay. And yeah, I just like had to be really honest about like, which one was more important my health or keeping, you know, keeping up the impression that I'm responsible and fulfilling my obligations and meeting deadlines. And I'm like all on top of my shit. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if it's going to make me sick to keep my shit together, like, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like anytime I've ever tried to play by culture's rules or stay in the box, like it just doesn't, doesn't go well in my system. So when I felt but I'm already feeling a little bit under the weather. I knew like if I go there, it was going to be like your situation where I feel disrespected or I feel like they're wasting my time or I feel like, I mean, if you just open yourself up for all kinds of crazy experiences that you wouldn't have had if you just honored that I don't want to go in the first place, you yeah. know? So now I think we're, I'm going to go on the 16th and that'll be a whole other experience. You yes. know, than what would have happened on November 26th. So yeah, I think there's like a divine timing element to it that has made it a lot easier as I do play this out 
it's amazing how many times I'll feel like, oh my God, I just, I can't meet with this person today. I need to cancel it or whatever. And then I do that because that honors me. And then the other person's like, thank you so much. Like I, I really didn't have the energy to do that, but I didn't want to say anything. And I'm really glad that we're going to postpone it or like, whatever, like usually when you don't want to, like, there's a bigger thing happening. Like there's a better time, not just for you, but maybe for everybody that's involved that when we listen to ourselves, like that can kind of align for everybody then potentially. Yeah. Yeah. I keep thinking, Maddie, give yourself grace. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you brought that up before. Yeah. And now in my head too. Her her voice of give yourself grace, like it plays <laughs> through my head on a regular basis and was part of that decision of, I already feel under the weather. I'm not Don't gonna it. do yeah. a gigantic work day where no, like that's not what I need right now. I need to rest and I need to heal and yeah, something's got to give. Otherwise my health is going to be what gives. And yeah, yeah. that's nope. You're more important. Yeah. I think things are starting to change. I don't know if after the pandemic and everything, I don't know, people's um, ideas about things are shifting a bit and there's more focus on, you know, taking care of yourself, your family. You yeah. Know. Like actually just enjoying your life. Yeah. Oh. Working from home more. Yeah. That's, people are trying to make that work. What's important maybe has shifted a bit and I I'm for it. Yeah. You know, I think overall it's going to be better for all of us. Yeah. It feels kind of like this, like more people in their integrity of what do they truly want? Mm -hmm. Not just running on the hamster wheel of Yes, I exactly. got to work and I got to save for retirement for 40 years. And like, that's what I'm doing. It's like, well, if that's what you want to do, that's totally, that's one thing. But if that's what you're doing, cause you think that's what you have to do, that's like, whoa. And then okay. I think, yeah, the pandemic like was a huge interruption to that expectation where we were all told to go home. I mean, most of us got to go home, not all of us, but Yeah. And then people get to decide, like, what do you want? Not just what you think you have to do, but like, what works for you? Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Anything else that comes to mind from the purgatory section? Oh, we could talk for hours and hours. There's so much there yeah. to unpack and how it, it, you know, how we recognize it in our own lives and everything. But yeah. I don't know, it seems like we've covered a lot. Yeah. Ooh, I had one piece pop into my head that feels like a fun note to end it on. And that's reiterating like the, the drama triangle to the empowerment dynamic that like in the drama triangle, there's the role of victim. And in the empowerment dynamic, victims become creators that like, here's this situation. And even if the situation is messed up or challenging or whatever, a creator looks at it and says, what am I going to make out of this? And so like, to like, just in a simple example, like your, your meeting where here's a situation where the meeting time that they're wanting is something that conflicts with my own truth this is messed up. I mean, it's mild, but this is out of alignment with my truth. And I get to create, I get to, you know, how am I going to handle this? What am I going to make out of this? What's it going to become? The fact that this thing outside of my truth is presenting itself to me, like, what am I going to make out of this to bring it into alignment with myself? Like, yeah, just being a creator with whatever you face, whatever challenge comes up, whatever challenger there is that there's a creative opportunity presenting itself to you and we can mix it with that. Yeah. It was a, a mild circumstance, but now it's affected change. Yeah. So yeah. agreed. Yeah. I know how I would handle it being in that differently. Yeah. Mm. So that's a success. Definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, 
like definitely all the things that we go through, like going forward and kind of in real time, but also looking back at other situations where we can see, you know, why, like, why was I in that uncomfortable thing to begin with? Like, what were the choices that I made that broke away from my truth? And what would the creator in me do differently next time? You know, and like, we can mine the past as far back as we want to go to figure out like, what did that experience give me as far as like tools to create with and whatnot? Yeah. Yeah. Something just occurred to me is you wouldn't want to reactivate the past. I know our culture has us doing certain things, but it doesn't feel good now. And no matter how I got here, it doesn't feel good. And it's important that I am happy and I do matter, Mm -hmm. even if it's a small thing. Mm -hmm. So, so that, yeah. I think looking at the past can be a double-edged sword for sure. Like, and in that way, it kind of reminds me of like shadow work, how like, I don't think we have to like necessarily go looking for our shadow or like go looking in the past, but like when things do come back up into our right now moment, it's no longer in the past. It's now in our now kind of thing Hello. Um, yeah exactly <laughs> well I had a moment like that where um I was processing something well like what I was telling at the very beginning about like being scared of heights and having to get up high yesterday and like my desire to do what I wanted to do like pushed me past my fear and as I was crawling down off of the cooler I had this like flashback to this traumatic experience in eighth grade where we were doing a ropes course and there was like a 10 foot wall where the exercise is like, you got to get the whole team up over the wall. And so they put like one person up there and then they put me, I was like the second one up there. And the intention was that everybody would just get down if you weren't one of the ones like lifting people up, up top or whatever. And I go to get down and I can't. And I'm stuck up there until the whole entire exercise is over. Everybody else has like got up over the wall. Everybody else got down. The only ones still up there are like trying to help comfort me so I can get down. I'm bawling like a baby. They're like, we'll catch you if you fall. And I'm like, you won't catch me. (laughs) It was absolutely traumatic having to climb down from there. And I remembered that yesterday, like in the moment like having to move towards the ladder, like that whole experience just like came rushing back. Like I was right back in the middle of it. And that was all the further it went last night. And then this morning, as I was journaling about all of that, which was already a lot, another dot connected that was like those same kids in my eighth grade class the year before in seventh grade had been bullying me. And that, you know, I believe I create my own reality and I believe I created my seventh grade year myself on purpose for reasons. Okay. But those kids, like they had taunted me and called me this name and like terrorized me. And then in eighth grade, I couldn't trust them to catch me. Like I didn't trust myself, first of all, to not fall off this ladder. And then if I do fall, I definitely don't trust you turds to catch me. Like I had so much lack of trust in that situation, both in myself and in others. And it's like, I haven't, I don't think about that seventh grade experience, like hardly at all anymore. Um, thanks to a few very talented therapists who have helped me unpack that along the way. (laughs) But this morning, looking back at like, I created that experience in seventh grade. I created that experience in eighth grade. I 
I did that. I wanted those experiences for everything that both gave me. And yeah, like kind of mining the experiences that do come up as relevant in the moment. Like I'm sitting on top of the produce cooler and looking at that ladder and it's like I was transported 20 years back in time. Like, and I was in the tree on the thing and the tree ladder, like, I can't do this. Oh my God, what am I going to do? You're going to have to bring a helicopter and come rescue me. <laughs> like that's clearly the only option. Um, so yeah, like I think the moments that are ready to like be transformed from the past they'll find a way to like connect into the right now moment and then working with them like changing shifting the perspective on them as best we can but yeah I'm I'm not necessarily a big fan of like diving back into the fat like the past just on purpose or like sitting down like I'm gonna do shadow work it's like when it's time it'll knock on your door and you'll know that there's something that's ready to be healed a little bit more. I like the way you laid that out because I am kind of, um, I have similar experience as yourself with the whole heights thing. I just, you brought back a memory and um, I don't want to go looking for things and I don't want to wallow in things, but you're totally right. And it's important to examine it yeah and that memory came you said that when you were up there that memory came back Mm -hmm. okay Mm -hmm. yeah I was like I didn't think about it at all being up there or like painting the sign or like any of that until it was time to get down and she brought the ladder over there and I'm like I get on my butt and kind of like get over to where I can put my feet off the side And I get my feet on the ladder and I need to like stand up onto the ladder. And I just like felt like I was made of spaghetti, like cooked spaghetti. Um, I just like can't move. And Dolly's like, you can do this. Like it's, you did it the other, like at this place. And I'm like, oh my God, you're not helping. (laughs) I'm scared. Okay. I can't do this. You won't catch me. (laughs) Oh yeah. Maybe I think this stuff, it comes up when there's some, something like relevant for your right now moment, you know? Yeah. I was just going to say, it's like layers or when you start excavating certain parts of your life, you know, you're kind of opening things up, but just take it one day at a time. Yeah. Like not your whole past. Right. Like you said, like, I don't want to wallow in it. I, I totally get that. Like, you know, there's times where kind of going back to Byron Katie's work, like, is it making you suffer or are you claiming your power and like examining the situation with new eyes? Like, yes. like yeah. And I think kind of being able to feel inside yourself, which it is, and is it time for distraction and like get off the subject of it? Like you sent me the, the other day about you hear Abraham Hicks's voice in your head of like, don't worry about it. Get off the subject, go do something else. Like, If it's hurting you, then yeah, get off of it. But to see how like past memories pop up and connect and like the, the epiphany that I had about seventh grade was I created that. I wanted that experience. I was not a victim to those people. They were not my persecutors. They were my challengers. Mm -hmm. And even though it has taken me over 20 years to receive the value of what those challengers brought to me I am and what it is is like they can think I'm ugly it might be true like Byron Katie says like maybe I am I don't know it doesn't matter like they can think whatever they want other people can think whatever they want and I don't have to let that impact me I can just like my mom trying to tell me how I should behave in front of my grandma like I don't have to let it impact me right they can think whatever they want and that doesn't have to be my reality but back then when I was 12 and oh god rocked my little world yeah begged my mom to change my school please send me to a different school oh breaks my heart yeah like no no toughen up like it's okay just just laugh it off 
if you don't give them a reaction, they'll stop eventually. I'm like, okay. God damn it. Great. <laughs> how, how brave, you know, that's awesome. Mm. I, I think about because when you're that age, just how difficult these situations are. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a big deal. The things that, you know, we all go through and much respect. Yeah. We got, we got here. Well, and even if it takes a couple decades to right? like find the good, because mm-hmm. I mean, as I think about it, especially in my twenties, I still had so much anger about that situation. I was angry at the kids at school. I was angry at my mom for not helping me in the middle of that. Like I was angry at myself for being ugly. <laughs> like I was so mad in my twenties and it's Abraham is one of the main ones that helped me to see, like we create our own reality. And I, I never really went back to that situation specifically to like figure out why did I create that for myself? But this morning I, yeah, I definitely see why I wanted that. I well, it's kind of like you and I were talking about there one time with my son conjunct Chiron, like how when I shine my divine light, it hurts. It, that seventh grade experience was like a bucket of cold water on my self-confidence and my self-esteem and my self-worth and my self-image. And it was like a giant brake pedal to all of those things. And it changed the trajectory of my life. And it, you know, it put me on the path that I wanted to be on. I wanted to spend that time as a miserable, depressed person. And I got a lot out of it. And I'm using those tools all day, every day to help other people feel better and to help myself feel better mostly. But because I feel so good at this point, like, yeah, like the person the other day, um, she sent me a text and she's like, it's so crazy. This is going wrong and this, and I don't know if I'm going to get this done on time. And I just responded and was like, none of that sounds like anything to stress about to me. If you don't get it done on time, we'll just order the rest later. And you know, like, it's okay. Just do your best and it'll be okay. And the only reason I'm able to say that and like truly believe it in the moment is because I had to let go of so much control with like all the years spent feeling so miserable. I couldn't help myself and yeah, like feeling ineffectual for so long that made me make peace with, I don't have control. And then when I actually let go of control, things seemed to get a lot better. Life seemed to get a lot easier and yeah, when you're not trying to control it, when you're not trying to control the outcome or like have expectations and make sure everything goes according to plan, life is a lot easier, a lot more fun. People are a lot nicer to you in general. There's just way less hurdles to have to jump over if you don't put them there. Right. It's so true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It like really mellowed me out a lot, I think is what it gave me. It's like, gave me a lot of humility to understand empathy yeah exactly compassion yeah Yeah. Yeah. being human is hard no matter what puts you in the depression I think we all end up there at some point whether publicly or privately and yeah you just never know like where people have been and what they've gone through and what it's given them in the long run. Yeah. So yeah, when a piece of the past comes back, maybe it has something that's worth unpacking a little bit. But absolutely. Yeah. And the timing's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think and when you or like organically let it come up, that's like the timing piece kind of working on your behalf. When you're ready, that, yeah. that part of it too. Yes. When yes. You're in a position where you can, yeah. if, you're little, if you're safer or when the timing's right. Exactly. 
<clears throat> like I think about, you know, 20 years ago, I had no coping skills. It just hurt. And now as it comes back up, like I see that pain so differently because of all the coping skills that I've built around pain mm -hmm. and yeah, like it kind of puts it in its place of mm -hmm. what really is pain. Yeah. It's a slowdown. It's a, it's like retrograde in astrology. Right. Like, yeah. Pause and reflect and <laughs> see if you want to keep doing it the way you were doing it before, because maybe you don't. Yeah. yeah. It's time to re-examine for yeah, sure. Exactly. When you're ready. Like a pause. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Mm. I feel like that's a nice place to leave it. Wow. This one was almost two hours long. <laughs> we, we really could sit here and talk for hours about the way of integrity. Um, yeah. uh, so until next time, I can't wait. Cause I have not read ahead. I, yeah, oh my gosh. Oh no, 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 no. I take it as it comes. Oh, so I love that. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited for you to read the paradise chapter. Um, yeah. When I listened to the Paradise chapter for the first time, I was maybe 20 minutes in, 20, 30 minutes into it. And that's when I got this whole epiphany that we have to have a book club. Oh, we okay. have to. Oh my God. Like that is exactly what I have to do. It was like my life's work at that point was to make the book club. <laughs> so yeah, I can't wait for you to listen and see like, what is your reaction to the Paradise chapter? It's, it's pretty beautiful. You want to talk about like full body chills. It's pretty cool. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. It's not really corny. We have two tickets to paradise. I don't know if you know, it. it's an Eddie Money song. I, I'm a different generation. Oh, I'll have to put a <laughs> link to it in the description box and I'll have to listen to it. But yeah, two, oh no, two tickets to paradise. I think I have heard it. I'll bet when I hear it, it'll, it'll come back to me. I can't believe I said it. Why? <laughs> I couldn't help myself. See, that's beautiful. Let it out. <laughs> I'm gonna listen to it when we're done here. I'm gonna totally. So that's fun. a perfect like setup for headed into the next one because <laughs> we do. We technically all have a ticket to paradise. Yes. That's like her whole point with this whole book is like a recipe on how to get there, how to actually live in paradise. It's possible. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited for you to read it. <laughs> so that's a good point. Our next yep. one and our last book club on this book. Next year. Be, yeah, it'll happen. Let me get over to my calendar and make sure I have the date right. It's the first Saturday in January. I know. And I do believe that that's the seventh. My calendar's not loading, of course. Um, so yeah, January 7th is the paradise section book club, and that'll wrap us up on the way of integrity. But I'm already thinking about continuing the book club of like meeting the first Saturday of every month and doing like part of a book. Cause I really loved like taking this only a few chapters at a time. So we could like really unpack all the awesomeness. I mean, yeah. I would love that. I was okay, going to cool. ask about that. I think yeah. we should. I think I have the next book picked out, but since you're not reading ahead, I'm just going to save it. We'll just, I yeah. Don't tell yeah, okay. it'll be a surprise. It'll be a surprise. Yeah. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll just plan to announce that like right after we finish up the next one. So anybody who wants to join us for the January 7th one is welcome. I'll put the link to RSVP to that. So you can find the zoom link um, down in the description box. Even if you missed all the other ones, you're still welcome. And yeah, I think that's it. We'll meet everybody next time in paradise. Sounds oh. perfect. Yay. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Myra. And thank you for Janine for being here earlier. Um, mm -hmm. I will see you guys next time. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah.